All right, if you're following along in your course manual, um, there's a reference down here to the bottom. We're on course page 20. So if you have that and bring it up um, or uh, are looking at it, you can mark that's where we started today. And we will, without any further ado, get going. So um, cutting the fat. Whenever you come into tough times, there are two ways to deal with the problem. Uh, you can pour more in the top or you can have less leak out the bottom. It's, it's the uh, bucket of water problem. If you have a bucket of water and it has leaks, you can either fill it more rapidly to keep it full or you can plug the leaks. And in the case of hard times, when we hit those, it's pretty hard to pour it in the top. That's kind of the definition of the hard time. So you have to figure out how to plug the holes in the bucket so that the bucket doesn't empty as quickly. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is of course, take stock of where you are. Uh, with one question on your mind, how does this expense help produce a buyer or a seller? So for this, uh, we're going to be applying some very good logic to how do you deal with the expenses. And honestly, there's not a whole lot different between running a business and running your personal finances. The two are separate, although they're related. And they are definitely the same principle. Uh, whatever you pour in the top minus what gets burned in the middle is what drops out the bottom. And the object is, in hard times, to cut the loss coming out the bottom uh, faster than the shutdown occurs for filling it back up. So we use criteria for that. Um, every expense needs to be scrutinized. And as you scrutinize it, you decide whether or not it's actually adding any value to your business or to your family finances. The two are inseparably linked, especially when you're a contractor and you are your own business. So every dollar invested is expected to have a multiple return. I've heard uh, Gary Keller say things as far as 5X. If what you're putting into your business is not producing at least five times that expense in revenue, then you really need to place it in a questionable category. So they talk about something called zero-based budgeting. They compare that in your student notes to doing a budget based on last year's expenses. And most big companies and those of us who have been in uh, the upper ranks of, of management and leadership in technology and engineering uh, know very good and well how we start with the budget we had last year. We have uh, growth and cutting goals based on how the quarter to quarter business is going and then we adjust accordingly. A zero-based system says, no, nope, you take everything to zero and then you add it back in. So back when I used to have to do layoffs in companies that had severe downturns, uh, there was one of those at Cisco uh, that was quite severe during the time I was there and running a big engineering organization and how do you do that? Well, there's so many factors, it can be very clouded. You have the jobs you need to get done, you have to have the personnel to do it, and there are people you like and work with really well, they're low friction members of the group. There are others that are more or less critical for what they supply, but they're difficult to deal with. How do you figure that all out? And another way to look at this zero base that's really visual, and I think you can catch the picture of it, is a parking lot exercise. So the way we used to consider it is you'd say, okay, I take my entire group, not literally, but figuratively, into the parking lot and stand them there. And then it's like being eight years old again and you're picking sides for a ball game. You figure out which ones are the most important and are gonna help your team and you bring them back first. Then you add that expense in. You see, do I have room for another? Okay, I have room for another. Who's the second one? Uh, this one and you bring that person in. You can do the same thing with expenses. Take all your expenses into the proverbial parking lot and then bring them back one by one. Now, most of us um, have a fair amount of experience in managing both the inside, what comes in as far as income and what goes out as far as expenses. And I've got 63% of a century under my belt of doing this and have learned some things about it. Plus, even though I was in engineering and project management and program office in my technical career over the course of years, I also worked a lot with salespeople because technical and engineering and 
uh, technical support of products often interfaces with sales folks. So I got to know a lot of sales people. And I had a gentleman in my first management job sit down with me one time and talk to me about what sales is like and how sales changes with people uh, based on the way a salesperson tends to approach their budget. And he had some interesting things and it cleared up a lot for me. The first problem salespeople tend to have, whether they sell real estate or high tech, is that they live from sale to sale. So that means that if they're flush, they spend money like it's water. And if it's tight, they get really panicky and they don't know how to do it, so they just cut everything back. And that, although you know, it, it follows the income curve of what you're reacting to, it also creates a really erratic lifestyle. Yet most salespeople I have known through the years live paycheck to paycheck. If they're flush, they spend, and if they're not flush, they don't. So as a result, they live in very high stress environments trying to cope with downturns because downturns are disastrous. Well, there's two things most people here in Santa Clara County uh, are gonna have as their first two personal expenses. First one is, of course, housing, and the second one is automobiles. Those are the two biggest things. So figuring out a strategy uh, when you're a salesperson in a good year about how to budget and hold your money so that during the lean years, which always come, that you don't have to have radical lifestyle changes like sell your principal residence or uh, default on the lease on your automobile. And there's a lot of ways to do that and different strategies that help you through. The other thing salespeople tend to fall prey to, in my experience over the decades, is that they, they overspend on image when it's not necessary. So I remember um, at Ungerman Bass, when I was a uh, manager of worldwide training for the technology, uh, there was a salesperson in our office who was the head of Northern California sales. And she brought a brand new, I think it was a 1995 Jaguar XJS Roadster in light diamond blue with a parchment uh, Van den Pla interior. That was the prettiest car I think I ever saw. That parchment interior in that light blue, it was gorgeous. And it was a pretty close to $100,000 car when most cars were 20. And I remember looking at that and I talked to the sales guy about it. And uh, this sales guy said, yeah, her district manager and VP and the national VP love to see folks buy cars like that because it's a hook. When they hook them and they spend that kind of money, they know they have their complete and undivided attention because they have to keep up with the payments, they have to keep up with the lifestyle, and it's a definite motivator. It motivates off the wrong end in that it tends to be fear and terror of loss rather than hope of gain that drives them forward, but it's still there. So I want you to think about this as an exercise and in your student manual, it definitely has um, some nice just T-charts on how to walk through your expenses and see for your business and for your personal life how you do uh, in making those work. So one of the things that you always kind of want to look at is, you know, 40% goes to continuing your business with a return, 40% goes as a buffer against hard times and the last 20% you can spend, uh, or variations of that. And there are actually quite a few variations of those percentages. It depends on where you are in your career and your volume, how you can adjust those. But at the end of the day, you have to figure out how you're going to do your end game for each decade of your life whether you're 20 something, 30 something, 40 something, on up till you get to be more than half a century like me. And you have to adjust your goals at each step of the way because times change. Now I made a decision when I was 20 something that savings was just really not an option. Getting into a home was impossible. This was back around, um, oh, that would have been 1990 when Percentage rates were running 15 to 20% for firsts 
and higher than that for seconds. And there were all these uh, arms that accelerated over time. And it was a brutal time to try and get started to buy a house. And so I made a decision back then that, okay, I'm not gonna be saving any money in my 20s. I'm gonna to look to my 30s and I'm gonna cut everything back when I hit my 30s after I get into my house and then relook at things when I hit my 40s. And it actually worked out pretty well. I was able to get into a house in my 20s and then when I hit my 30s, uh, there were no new cars, there were no big expenses, there were no great vacations. It was pretty much recovered from my 20s. And then when I hit my 40s and 50s, I did other silly things like occasionally buy a new car, uh, where normally I drive ancient cars that are kept in classic condition. Uh, that's a little hint for any of you who, who have a mind toward vehicles. You know, I can drive a Toyota, um, well, let's see, if I said I drove a Toyota Camry, a nice Camry, or I can drive what's in my garage, which is a 17-year-old uh, supercharged Jaguar Roadster. And the Jaguar Roadster looks like brand new and it takes some effort to keep it that way. I have no payments. It costs me two to 4,000 a year in preventative maintenance to keep it on the road. And it always starts more conversations than a brand new Camry. So you have to think about things like that. Now, that may not be the thing for you. And you know, anytime somebody suggests you buy a Jaguar, you should probably um, cross them off your list of people to listen to. Um, because they have a reputation. I have burns all over my arms from when I was 20 something buying old Jaguars and fixing them up. So um, figure out what those expenses are and come back to zero, then bring them back in. Here's another neat little thing to think about when you're, you're doing expenses. I guarantee when you go through your personal and your business expenses, you can probably name your first two or three really accurately. This is my number one expense. This is my number two expense. This is my number three. The question is between expense number four and expense number 20, how well can you stack those? And in my experience, those are difficult to stack and that's where the surprises come. So, I don't know about you guys, but we all have areas that we like to spend money on and they aren't houses and cars. Those are just too expensive. Can't do that every day. But there are other things we do like to do. So let me ask you a question. This is supposed to be interactive. How many of you know what a big expense is below the third expense that has kind of surprised you when you sit down at the end of the month and figured it out? Anybody got an example? Eating out. Yes. Eating out, absolutely. Ding, 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 ding. I have that. How much you spend a month on eating out there, uh, if I may ask? A lot. Nothing now, but <laughs> before shelter in place, <laughs> quite a bit, probably. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I won't put you on the spot. But eating out's a huge one. I worked in downtown Palo Alto on Hamilton, one block off university for a startup I was in uh, that netted me a very good return. And I ended up being bought up by. Cisco and went to Cisco and that's how I started there. But I have never spent more money on food because every day the entire startup walked to lunch in downtown Palo Alto with Spago's and Cafe Fino and all of these great restaurants. I was spending 700 bucks a month on lunch. It was crazy. I couldn't understand where all my money was going. And I looked back through my bank record and guess where it was? it went to eating out in Palo Alto downtown. So thanks, Melissa, that's a good one, eating out. Who else, who has a different one? A surprise in that expense number four through 20. Anybody? Oh, well, I, uh, I, I'm doing two things here. I'm doing that PPP, but I, we keep a lot of, we go through all our taxes, you know, Dennis did accounting for years. Cool. And I, I so I'm sort of fussy, and I go, well, I don't want to take all this travel. I want to dec I wanted to decrease my expenses. He goes, right. well, you went. <laughs> so I go, well, I did. And part of it was, you know, there was three conferences. There was the KW conference was in San Diego. But, you right. know, when you're there, those things add up because they charge to go. And then 
it happened to be that CCIM was there and then we had another one. So that added up to more than I wanted it to. <laughs> so I cook a lot at home. <laughs> okay, I, that I was your expenditure. Okay, good. Is there another? Third one and then we'll go on. No one? Right now we're not spending anything on gas. So we were doing like $600 a month in gas. Yeah, gasoline has dropped to nothing. Uh, do you find though that you spend on other things when you know you're not spending one, one category you spend in another? Amazon likes me right now. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I know I do. Um, those little things for the kids you know we get the kindle i was just trying to cut some things back uh, but you know there's all these little things that add up that they want you know not only school books you know we have two college things but you know they just add up when they need them like they have to read something for school and then they end up going on amazon to get the books so all those little things they need add up. absolutely and you know what that doesn't change no matter how old they are. <laughs> My oldest one is almost done with his doctorate. Woohoo! Within the next month or so, I can cross that expense off of my list. The younger son's one third of the way through law school, so I know pretty much what my liability is there. But it's amazing when they're 28 and 30, you know, my pockets still open magically and the dollars just float right out, which is okay. I budget for that. Um, but yeah, those expenses, you don't see them sometimes coming. Dad, the car broke down. Or dad, the dog had to go to the vet. Or dad, uh, I was gonna go with my girlfriend up to blah, blah, blah. And um, I could use a little extra money. Uh, yeah, me too, son. So what I, <laughs> what, I, uh, what I tell them now, and you guys might get a kick out of this. When I get frustrated with my budget, I do what I call Denison days. So Denison's exactly. chili is good. It's less than a buck and a half a can, and I can live a whole day on a single can of Denison's chili. So when my sons come after me for, hey, Pop, you know, uh, can you take care of this, blah, 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 and usually I will, and I say, yeah, just realize that your father is at home, and now I'm going from Denison Wednesdays to Denison Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So if you're okay with that, I'm okay, never mind. <laughs> you know, they, they feel bad. I guilt them. I guilt them, darn straight. You know, I didn't go to a Catholic graduate school for nothing. Uh, you know, those Jesuits taught me how to feel guilty. So, um, anywho, so those need to be done both on your personal life and they need to be done on your business. You probably know what the top two expenses is. So what I'm going to challenge you is you use the workbook um, tables that they set up and work through it and see what your business, and see if you can find a surprise. And if you find a significant surprise about where your money's going and what it is doing based on rate of return, let me know next week. Let's, let's talk as a group about it and see if there's any surprises in the way we budget. So start so, chatting, go, yes, go ahead. So I had, I encounter my renewal to Disclosure IO this week, and I didn't know if to pay it or not. So I'm still debating on that. What do you guys think? How many listings do you carry? Not right now. But you, how many when, do you plan to do in the next year? At least five. And how much is the uh, disclosures I owe? Three ninety nine. Three hundred ninety nine dollars. Mm -hmm. So probably what a little right, listing, maybe a little more. Oh yeah, right around eighty dollars a listing, right? Mm -hmm. worth it because you can have a similar outcome for free yeah i the can email you, you them can, <laughs> yeah you can post this you, you can post them to dropbox you post them on the mls you don't get the quite the same tracking and insight you do that you get mm -hmm. with disclosures io is that something that you use disclosures io yeah i use it yeah, you I use like the it. track i mean you yeah. watch what the people are doing yes and what programs mm -hmm. you, you follow all that stuff yeah because i use um and I have a property minder website and they host disclosures. That's all included. Um, and they track, it tracks who takes it and opens it, but it doesn't track their activity in the, uh, in the disclosures. Like disclosures I is the only one that I know that does it that well. I, I would say like, if you're doing a lot more listings for sure, keep it, but I don't know. 
for five listings, eighty dollars a listing. It's a bit. It's up to you. Yeah. Thank you. That's what I'm pondering yeah. upon. <laughs> to cut. This is a good but, time to be pondering. Yeah, print, I mean, any kind. Of, I'm looking at advertising. That's not. I'm really looking at what's bringing me returns. Right. If something is generating leads, then you keep doing it. But if there, there's always stuff you try that isn't quite as uh, proven results oriented, if you will, and all that stuff you cut out until times are better. But the proven stuff that's generating work that you're seeing a benefit from, as long as I mean, if you're generating leads, right, you're hopefully returning with those. That's providing a return. Try to get a seven to eight, eight to one return. Mm -hmm. And in the future, do you see uh, anything in command that's going to be able to host our disclosures there? They should. And we probably could. You could probably rig, rig it to do it now in a way because you can make a landing page and post the disclosures on the landing page. Throw a uh, lead capture on top of it. For those that's, of all, that that's all it really is. For those of us who are inside of Keller Williams, you know, you can always use the uh, request function on command to request what they develop. One of the things I'd like to see is a roadmap. Most big applications when you're developing them, since that was my stock and trade for 30 plus years, um, they have roadmaps and it shows what major type features are coming when. And I know there are some things I'm interested in that are being developed, but I don't have a roadmap as to when they're gonna be developed or in what sequence. So you might request that within command to ask that they start publishing a roadmap. It's just a thought, if we all do it, you know, every yeah, one of those is, is a vote. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're talking about uh, storing the files so other people can see them or I, I, what's the total request? You know, the, the goal, is it keeping all the documents for one file, for one listing, or is it keeping all of them in the past so you can retrieve them again? Okay. I think that's a question for Lapita and Mark. Yes? Yeah, well, it's not, well, for me, storing the disclosures online is just a convenient way to get uh, interested buyers to or the interested parties to access that information and for me to then track exactly who who they are so then that I could follow up with them uh, to see where the offers are where they stand if there's any questions that they have you know well, depending this, is, on the, this is during the escrow so I'm just asking because oh yeah during during the escrow it's all said and done um, yeah, yeah well then then at, at that point you're all you should be a little bit beyond the discussion the disclosures and the way we're doing business for the most part these days, right? I mean, most well, part, the disclosures are being taken before even making an offer. That, that's then, what I'm asking because what I'm doing, I am actually been working on a more complicated, complex system because of the commercial. And it's a lot of work, but I'm finding that it works, but it's off of Airtable. And it's, I had to spend hours researching, but there isn't a way. And I've talked to Susan Song at length who wanted to create a CRM so we don't have it for commercial. So I've been working with this whole system of uploading and I may upgrade. That's what I'm thinking about because you can download, you can share just one row. Well, Bob, you know, it's like a complicated Excel sheet and you can right. move a lot of ways and it literally will have all the pad sites I have, but it'll have, if it's a buyer, an investor, a person that's, you know, ex that's ready to go, but, if once an offering memorandum has been taken off the market on Coaster, you can't get it. So you have to keep them because these things come and go, the same property. So I've been trying to store them and that's what I'm in the middle of. And so I'd like to see that come on if they did it to command, but I don't think they can. And I was trying to ask her, Susan and I were emailing back and forth. We've been doing this back and forth for a couple of years now. And so I had started client look, which is our CRM. So it's just complicated. So I would like a way, but I'm, I'm figuring out my own way, but it's just more work. It's a, if anybody wants to have a little lesson on it, it's a good way to store. You can pick a property address, the name of the address and the file. And let's say if it's multi-units, how many, and you can sort it 
by what that investor wants and then you can search that and add it to his particular file and keep it. Like if you rejected it, liked it. So when you're searching, it's a pretty interesting system. It's just a lot of work. <laughs> cool. Very good. Let's press on. Thanks, Maureen. Okay, the rest of these I think are fairly straightforward. I'm not going to belabor the obvious whenever possible. Um, so find your margin. That's the bottom line. Uh, think of two areas today where you can make cuts. Uh, take a look at around course page 22. And think of three more areas you can commit to making cuts starting next week. So see if you can find those. We'll touch base at the beginning of class next week and kind of see where we are with those. Okay, two big things, payroll and lead generation. Uh, again, back to the idea of cutting out anything that's unnecessary. So what kind of things can you do with staff? And this gets really into a philosophical con uh, conversation about what is the easiest to cut and what's the easiest to add back? So there are two elements to that equation. There's a lot of things, everything's easy to cut or more or less easy to cut. I can cut a Xerox machine expense and I can cut a staff member. But which ones are the easiest to put back when things get better? Is it the Xerox machine or the staff meeting or the staff person? And that's, that's actually not a real straightforward question. It underlies um, your personal philosophy, your ethics, um, how you approach business, what's expendable and what is not. Those are all big pieces. So with staff, uh, they kind of go on here. There's things you can do. You can cut hours, combine positions, offer bonuses rather than salary increases. It's always a good idea, I think. Offer a package if you want to uh, ask a person to leave and uh, listen to what your staff wants. The one I'm going to really focus on is the last one. Listen to what your staff wants. I have been in many positions where I was forced into layoffs based on company goals that when you're running 300 to 600 engineers worldwide, reducing staff is a daunting activity and it has a huge impact on people's lives. So one of the things that I figured out when I was in my mid thirties is occasionally you should ask your staff uh, what they want to do. What are their preferences? I've had folks in their late fifties say, you know, Bob, please give me a package. I just want out of here and retire. I'm moving to Florida and I don't ever want to see engineering again. That's good to know, right? Uh, because they're fairly senior and they're, let's say they're good employees. Uh, that would not be the first one on your mind. Uh, you look at somebody who's 20 and they've just bought their first house six months ago and now they're in danger of being laid off. Yipes. That is a really horrible thing to have to endure both as the person who is being considered to be laid off and for those of us who used to have dark brown hair and now have gray hair uh, because we had to make decisions like that for too many years. So ask them what they want to do. I've also run into a lot of situations where uh, staff people wanted a break. They didn't want to lose their job, but they could use a break. And I've had been able to reduce, for instance, administrative staff uh, to part time with kind of some tricks I won't share about how I kept their, their health insurance uh, while they were part time, but work them into a two days or three days off a week. They loved it. They could coast for a while and they knew they had a job when things turned back right. And at the same time, they had time, right? That's the problem when you're 20 through 40. You either have time or you have money. You don't have both. So you work like a dog and you've got all this money, but then what? There's no time to spend it or do anything you want to do. So always ask your staff what they want to do. And in real estate, there is, because we're all contractors, um, there's very few that are full-time employees in our brokerage. It's a great question to ask. Do you really want to do it? You want to stay that many hours? Um, you know, have a, a conversation with your, your next superior about what do you need to do? I had one of those with Alan and said, Alan, if you get in a tight spot, let's talk about what some of the options are. So he and I had that option. He said, hell no, you're not going to do that. So um, that was the end of that conversation. 
So there are things you can do um, and always start with the person. And hopefully it's just like kids, little kids. Why do they run to mom and dad when they're hurt? Because they have a relationship there. There's a trust there. And kids run to their parents because they know their parents is looking out for their best good and they trust them. They don't go to strangers. They don't even like it when it's an aunt or an uncle. They want mommy or daddy because that's where their primary trust is. Before hard times happen, build that kind of relationship with your staff. You want them to trust you implicitly so that when times get hard, you can have these conversations and have honest conversations about what to do to help everybody. But you have to build the, the relationship in advance. You can't do it after the fact. It has to be in advance. So always work with your staff that way. I'm very much in belief that the more lightly you hold power, the better it is. Don't overlord, just exercise minimum authority that's necessary to get the job done and no more. So build those relationships and figure out how you can adjust staff. Now we've made an office decision at Keller Williams Santa Clara Valley that staff would be the absolute last thing we cut because it's really hard to add back. It's not that you can't find a warm body. Can you find the tribal knowledge and the experience and the fit? And fit is huge. Culture about teams and how they work together. I have coached basketball teams for junior high and grade school where there were a bunch of superstars on the team. I had one kid who was, he was 11 at the time and he could sink 70% from beyond the three point lines in gameplay. I've never seen a kid that small shoot like that. But he was on a team that they were all superstars and they couldn't play as a team. But I also coached other teams where they're all pretty good players, but they played as a team. And frequently they did as good or better than the superstars. So get your team together, build it. And then when times get hard, do some honest negotiation back and forth about what you can do to meet the financial uh, challenges you have in a downturn. Okay, lead generation is the other one. Um, how do you get lead generation? Uh, do you pay for it? Is it? Are you still struggling outside of command? Command is basically free to us. Um, it's not at least charged out separately. And it, it gives you a bucket load of value for basically nothing. Um, anybody still on anything other than command in our office? I know what the statistics say, but um, there are still holdouts. I'll just leave it at that. It's, it's about less than half for the total count between Santa Clara doesn't Valley and me. Silicon City are still that not. Surprise me. What's that? That doesn't surprise me. Yeah, it's, it's not that think, command is bad. It's that we have our databases where they are and they're comfortable with them where they are. It's a challenge to learn a new right. system. and It's a challenge to learn something new and free. Yeah, it's coming from a place for my last company that forced us, forced the door shut. A lot of people were distrustful. Half the, half the people that even went to Compass, that they're not even touching the Compass technology. Right. They're all, they're all paying for their own because they don't want to have that disruption again. It's funny you would say that, Mark, because that was one of my main concerns that I raised about recruiting. Um, because recruiting in command is, yeah, we've got all this stuff for free. And then you think about, well, yeah, but if all your business is in the corporate application, do they own your data? And in which case you lose your whole business. And Mark, that's the same thing I did. I went, yeah, they would. So who in their right mind would do that until... I brought that question up to the right person in the technology group, namely um, somebody who does a lot of our presenting on a monthly basis. So Zach Younger, and I talked to Zach about that. And Zach said, oh no, Bob, Keller Williams does not own the data that's in your contact list for your real estate business. He says, there is a pledge that everybody has to sign both within the corporate leadership and within any partners outside that basically says you don't get to keep, including Keller Williams, any of the contact data when an agent leaves. 
the agent takes it with them. Oh, yeah. Now that's huge because I thought it was the other way around. I figured that they held rights. Every place else I've worked, if you put anything in a company system, it's gone. It belongs to the company. But apparently in ours, it does not. The agent, and apparently that was driven from Keller himself because his philosophy was, look, the contact list is the agent's business. If you take that away, the agent doesn't have a business, so of course it belongs to them exclusively. I was impressed. I don't know about you guys, but I'm impressed that that's what our company did. That's the right thing to do. And Bob, I Bob, that's the way it is in all the companies. You, you have two days at BHG. Uh -huh. So they, because we're independent contractors, they have different rules. Like I, and Mark could answer this probably more for other companies. But if it's an escrow, even KW has it like you split something if right. it's with that broker. But all your clients, what they do is they tell you, like, take them out of the CRM quick because they can keep it, and some of them, or you can take them. And so they all have something like that. But it, so if you don't delete them all, you have to download and delete it or something. But they get, so that, I don't know, what's anybody else seen? That's just what I've seen with a couple different ones. Anyone? No one's I been to I think it's just a convenience factor. There's a lot to do with it too. Yeah. yeah. Sure, nobody wants to learn a new system. That's why Apple and Microsoft operating systems in PCs is like arguing religion. I mean, people who love Macs love Macs and they don't care what you come up with statistics wise about what the latest um, Microsoft based operating system looks like they don't want it. They don't want any part of it because it's not Mac. There is such a cult following around Apple products. You know, I bought the last one I bought was uh, my iPhone and the guy sticks the iPhone in front of me and looks at me with this silly look on his face. And I couldn't understand what he was doing. I it was like, okay, he was going to open it. We were going to open it and put some things on it and do some things to it. And I looked at him and said, it's okay. Uh, why can we open it? He goes, sir, I didn't want to presume that you didn't want the unboxing experience. <laughs> it's a phone. I don't care how it's wrapped, but apparently I'm alone in that. A lot of people, that is not the case. They want to take every little piece of specialized plastic and examine it and set it aside oh, look at this packing. Isn't it precise and wonderful? Okay, whatever. Who does but, it? but yeah, change is, change is hard to do, whether you're Mac or PC, whether you're this CRM or that CRM, you get used to what you get used to and you don't want to use anything else until you actually use something else that is substantively better and then you're glad you changed. And people so, have commitment issues too, you know how it is. If you commit, no if, you, you if you commit your business onto onto command, you're committed to command. Yes, right. You're. Yep. It's tough to unwind that if you decide to to open up your own or ever break away from Keller Williams, That's even right. though you can export your database and it's your database. It's not function like once it's flowing in there and everything's functioning the way it's functioning. Right. It's not. It's not something you can just detach and keep running. It's something you have to detach and rebuild. It's very actually kind of smart to keep people. Uh, but it, it, uh, if the stuff works really well, that's something you have to consider. Absolutely. Yep, that makes sense. So in our slide here, that last one, um, I want to make a comment about borderline performers. So what do you do with poor performers when you have a staff? And according to the millionaire real estate agent, that's one of the first things you add is staff members as you grow your business into a team. So what do you do when you have staff members who were not the best hire? Well, having hired so many people over so many dec decades into so many positions, I have some practical advice. Whenever possible, rent to own. Always start with a temporary contract and see how the person's working out, if you can, and then convert them into a full-time employee based on performance and fit. 
interviewing is a very complicated thing and trying to make people fit within a group is not an easy task. And part of the reason I'm here is because Alan saw the way I did it in high tech with medium to huge groups and it worked very oddly well. And it was not what is typically done. So there's some things about borderline performers. Um, don't wait to the downturn to deal with the performance. Deal with it when it is a performance, even in the good times. And there are basically two choices. Uh, first, communicate clearly what needs to change and be reasonable, listen, make it a two-way conversation. Because a lot of times we think we're brilliant and clearly communicating and we're not. Um, why can't you read my mind? Uh, well, nobody can. So um, have those conversations and keep them ongoing. There are two things people thrive on. One of them is acknowledgement when they're doing a good job. And if they're always doing a bad job or doing a mediocre job, you're not going to be acknowledging when they do something right. And then the whole morale thing just tips off the edge of the table and crashes onto the floor. So manage your performance with your folks uh, early rather than late and make sure they're in the right job. It's very important to get people into things they like. There's actually uh, some pivot principles on this about staffing my role, which is a team leader. And it's kind of funny, they said, uh, you, based on intelligence, if the person is really intelligent by their definitions, um, they can exist longer in a role that doesn't actually fit them, but they'll eventually bail out from it. And it doesn't matter, in my opinion, whether you're looking at an admin or a coordinator or a person to oversee paperwork, all of those require a mindset and a skill set that the people like to do. People like to do what they like to do. So find the job that they like to do and get them in it. So manager performers, don't use the downturn as the, finally I can, I can replace so-and-so with someone else. Uh, you've compromised your business for a long period of time and you've probably compromised your relationship with that person. So I've moved people in and out of positions over the course of years. Most I've been able to repurpose into something they liked, some I could not. Um, but it's a way to approach people. If they're a value to you, they are worth the conversation and the effort it takes to make sure that the working relationship is functioning properly. So take the time to do that. Okay, um, prospecting and marketing. Uh, you want to shift in a shifting market, which we're definitely in. Um, Mark, do you have any real, any crisp data on where the market's going? I saw some things nationally. Did you see from the National Association of Realtors? Um, there are some statistics out. At least I saw them. Oh, no, I, I, didn't, I wasn't privy to the national uh, statistics, but I have been following the local. Yep. Um, as far as, uh, you know, what things are moving and it, what our inventory is like and pending sales and whatnot. And we're still pretty strong and steady in Silicon yep. Valley. Uh, our inventory active depending listings has, the gap has been growing, but it's still very favorable towards, uh, towards the seller's market. Yeah. Um, you know, 750 pending, 1300 or so active listings. It's still inventory is super low. Um, so yeah. Uh, on a national level, I could imagine there is more suffering because remember our market here is driven predominantly by tech and most tech workers are teching along. They're working from home, but they're still making their salaries and yeah. they're not suffering. Um, other parts of the country is a different story. You know, Las Vegas, for example, uh, their whole workforce is unemployed. So their situation is a lot different than ours. Yeah. Um, we can't really look at the national statistics to, to counsel our clients as to what they should be doing or what they should be looking for. Right. Um, you know, locally here, the people I've been talking to, I've been trying to just set them at ease saying, look, the and it's true, the prices are not falling. Yeah. Um, we have our, uh, that presentation by uh, Dr. Wei, the economist that on that um, last few days ago, actually a uh, very good presentation. I think he was pretty on, um, what we should guy, expect. Right? What's that? He's the Calbury guy. Yeah, I think so. 
Yeah, I heard him live. He's he is really good. So uh, yeah, basically he was saying, well, I mean, there is no price erosion. The prices are remaining exactly where they are. The transaction count is down because yep. we're artificially suppressed. And I know I'm holding listings back that are occupied that are that should be on the market now, but are not on the market now. They're waiting for the SIP to be over. It doesn't make any sense to put one on the market if you don't have to, unless it's vacant. Um, so I think that once the SIP is lifted, our market's going to go a little nuts. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's building up pressure. That's what it feels like, at least from where I sit. Uh, I don't follow the numbers as closely as, as you do. The the good news is, is for for those preparing listings, is uh, I read about 15 minutes before class started uh, that uh, they're going to ease some of the guidelines for shelter in place, and they are going to allow construction. So good. now we can start prepping those listings properly. Uh, we were before, but you weren't supposed to. The guys weren't supposed to be. And I have two homes on my street. Uh, they're banging their hammers. They're working on projects they shouldn't have been. Uh, but now they can legally and not worry about it. Yeah. So, uh, my no. street as well. I live in a really old neighborhood that was developed around 1947, right after World War II. And at least half of these houses on my street and area have been torn down and redone. And there have been several huge overhauls uh, to houses on my street. And they're still banging away. They have been through the whole thing. They have a, a smaller crew, but the crews are still working. So it's good to see. And there's going to be this crazy disconnect on how we recover out of this. Um, uh, yesterday, I had to go to Home Depot. Um, it's time to get the tomato plants in the pots. And uh, I was over there, and there was uh, Santa Clara County Sheriff, three sheriff cars and a motorcycle cop standing outside of Home Depot in Cupertino, uh, making sure that people had masks on and stuff. That's why they were there. But none of them had masks on. And then as I was leaving, the motorcycle cop was talking to a group of 20 day workers standing shoulder to shoulder, and the cop and the 20 day workers None of them had on any masks. So, you know, there's a lot of inconsistency. You go into, um, you go into Jamba Juice and nobody's got a mask on. And you go into Five Guys and everybody's got a mask on. So, you know, this is, I think this is just going to be the way it is. And real estate's going to be no exception. Um, I think we're going to loosen up. They say now, what, June is when the governor intends to, to kind of lift dish things. Um, and we'll see. I, I'm pretty sure we're not going to be going back to man the office, so to speak, until June. But I think real estate sales is going to loosen more and more as time moves. We got to eat, Bob. What's that? Gotta Everyone's got to eat. Everybody's got to eat. That's right. Things get ugly when they can't. And let's see, a thousand dollar stimulus check is going to last about two weeks for a family of four, if they're lucky. You know, so what if, they they get, if they get it before October, if they get it. Yeah. So, you know, um, eating your eating your fingernails is not a great diet, although it does great for your waistline. It tends to tear up other stuff. And uh, the Denison diet. You have to be old, single and crotchety to get away with stuff like that. Uh, it tends to make households really unhappy when you, you know, open the can of Denison and uh, you know, you eat it out of the can cold because you don't want to take the time to heat it up. So, um, so yeah, we all uh, we all have our challenges there, I guess. So, if you're going to suffer, you might as well really suffer. Eat it cold. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to get suffering points, you know, you really want to maybe self-flagellate while you're doing that, like the monks, you know, from the Middle Ages. So, although I don't recommend that, we're kind of off the track. Let me let me move forward. <laughs> okay, what not to cut. Um, First, don't cut your customer service. So one of the main thing, the book or the student manual goes into, it talks about do more stuff yourself, be more engaged. You wanna see how to do that, watch Alan. I mean, literally watch Alan. And if you don't wanna watch Alan because you're tired of looking at Alan, watch a vet. <laughs> and what you'll see from them, and those are the two teams in my office. I'm sure there are also same things going on in uh, Silicon City. 
there are teams where the leader of the team is now engaged even more heavily than they were three months ago before this all started. And I'm watching that with Alan. And Alan is a force of nature to watch when he cranks up. Um, when he was still 21, when I first met him as an adult and he worked in my org in Cisco, he could do the work of five human beings. I used to say he was this, this great speedboat with giant motors in it that would go 100 miles an hour, but he had a rudder about this big. So direction was sometimes a problem, but boy, he had the horsepower and the speed. Well, he's developed the rudder thanks to, I think, Katie and large. That's my opinion, not necessarily his. Um, oh, he'll agree. And, what's that? He'll agree. Yeah, I think he would. Uh, at least he does with me in private. I don't know what he says in public, but but he is now fully engaged. I'm watching him move at the speed he did back when he was 20 and 30 uh, rather than in his 40s. And it's been kind of funny because when he started to get in his late 30s, I made comments to him long before I worked to him with him. I said, you know, Alan, you're slowing down finally. No, I'm not. I am not slowing down. How can you say that? I'm not getting slow. It's like, oh, okay, calm down. Okay, I, I could be wrong. You know, I did fast forward about five more years and one day we're at lunch and he says, you know, Bob, I'm slowing down. <laughs> well, whatever was happening there, Alan is the perfect one to watch because he is not moving slow right now. I haven't seen any him move like this since he was 20 something. He's really engaged. He's giving customer service. He's leading his team. And Yvette's doing the same thing. Yvette is hugely engaged. I don't know her as well as I know Alan, but I have watched the kind of things she's doing. And she's engaged. The team, you know, Kenny's here. Uh, he can attest to it that uh, she's focused and moving forward. And that's an awesome thing. So do that. Keep your customer service up. Don't cut training and coaching. Okay. Now I'm going to stray from the true path here. Um, I may be a little bit of a heretic. Always take a look at the cost of training and coaching against the ROI. Now, why do I say that? Well, very pragmatically. Is the problem with you're trying to solve with training and coaching that you don't know what to do or you do know what to do, but you don't have the discipline to do it or do you know yourself well enough to know that, yeah, I know what to do, but I need the motivation or it's not going to happen. That's where you have to know yourself. You know, to thine own self be true. Uh, if you're a person who is self-motivated and can drive that way, do it and cut your expenses. If you're a person who knows what to do and you need some help motivationally, get it. Because if it drives forward and it's given you a 5X or more return on investment, why wouldn't you do it? Go do it. It's different people and different personalities. And we all approach the world a little bit differently, even if we do clump into categories. So um, keep an eye on what training. Keep, what's that? <clears throat> say don't necessarily cut, not cut it. You want to absolutely look at it and make sure everything is yes. for you. If it's working for you, then don't cut it. But there if it's go. not working for you, if there is some aspects of uh, the, the philosophies aren't true, the systems that they're implementing aren't providing res the results that you're looking for, right. cut that and find something else. There you go. Perfect. Well put. Okay. Make the most of what you have. That is always a good one. Uh, my mother's family, been here since before the American Revolution, and they are generation upon generation of subsistence farmers. Had family farms of 80 to 100 acres, and that's how they lived, generation to generation. My mom was the first one to went to college, and she has a degree in a hard science, which was unheard of in the family. She was the first to get it. So um, you definitely want to do what you are needing to do to make your business go forward. So use your energy. Put your creativity uh, and your energy into the work. There is nothing more telltale of a group that's working well together than to see what their creativity factor is. Now, I tell you straight up, Stacy and Olivia and I get along and click 
as a group doing leadership like almost no other group I've ever had. There's only been a couple in my entire career that work together like this. And the way you can tell it's working is creativity just boils up out of pretty much every meeting and conversation. Somebody will go, you know, I was thinking, maybe we could do this. And it just, it's organic. If you want to know if your group is working right, see what the creativity factor is. If it's bubbling up and it's happening as part of the spontaneous way the group interacts, you've got a good group. And whatever you're doing, keep doing it. If it's not happening, figure out how to build those relationships so that it does. Because that's a really important thing. FaceTime is important. This is killing me to have to do everything on Zoom. I'm a face-to-face -face guy. If I interact with human beings at all, which I am an overcompensated introvert, if that means anything to you psychologically, if not, forget it. It's just another one of Bob's odd sayings. But the bottom line here is that I like communication face-to-face. -face. My family laughs at how clipped my phone calls are. My sister will call me up. We wanted to discuss some big thing, and it's, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, Lynn, thanks, bye. <laughs> That's it. It's hard to get me to talk on the phone. And now I'm having to learn to talk on the phone every day for recruiting. I'm having to do Zoom all the time. And I am a deer caught in the headlights when it comes to turn a camera on. So as we start back, and remember part of this whole pivot thing is not that we're gonna make everything that's difficult right now work as well as it did before. What we're trying to do is wind a mainspring so that as soon as this lifts and life goes back to a more normal way, you can be first out of the gate and sprint down that, that straightaway heading to the first turn. That's the idea. So get that clock spring wound so that when everything, when somebody says go, we can move forward full speed. So face to face, be ready with that. Uh, get more assistance, not assistance. Uh, that's, that's cute. It's clever. Um, uh, they talk in the, the student notes about um, you can find different types of people uh, to help you with things. Um, people who want to work from home that are on the full-time parent track and just wanting something to do on the side. They can be retired. Um, there's all kinds of ways to find alternatives to higher expense ways to do the same thing and then work with preferred partners. It's kind of interesting with all the recruiting that I do um, and have done uh, because it just happened to be in, most of it was in engineering, but uh, sales is a little different, but not completely different. And what you run across is that people stay in jobs for very interesting reasons. One reason is math. That's where they get the biggest return on investment and their careers and businesses are going well. The second reason is because they enjoy the people they work with. I have literally abandoned good career situations in favor of something much more risky because I wanted to work with a set of people that I liked. I have made more decisions in my career around who am I going to be working with than what am I going to be doing, which is kind of odd, but that's my value set. I like working with people I like, and I don't like working with people who I don't like. So there you go. It's not saying I'm perfect. It's just saying that mix to me is high on the priority chain because the rest of the stuff's already there. The money's there, the security, what had to be done is done. And so now my primary value is who am I working with and do I like doing it? And if I do, man, you couldn't get me out of there with a crowbar because I'm working with folks I love to work with. So build that kind of a team, work with your preferred partners, whether it's a title company or a loan officer, somebody you can click with and really get things done. Now that's something I notice that um, is true. I'll bet every one of you has a preferred loan officer. Is that true? People you've worked with and you love working with them because the communication is easy meaning that it tends to be clear between the two of you and it just plain works. So those are all really important. You wanna have those kind of relationships so that your partners you work with are streamlined. Again, you remember from last time we met, 
I gave you an engineering formula, which was energy input into a machine minus friction equals output. So you minimize the friction in between. That's your preferred partner. So that when you put um, three horsepower at the input shaft, you get 2.95 at the output shaft because there's almost no friction in the system. That's what you want. So I'll leave you on that thought this week. Um, get your partnerships ready, coil your spring so that your relationships, your expenses are under control and you're ready as soon as this SIP lifts, which you know it's not likely it's gonna be much more than another month maximum. You're gonna have the opportunity to watch just like a racehorse. They ring the bell and the gate opens and you are straight off down the straightaway and you wanna be the first one to the first corner. So good luck this week in doing that. Again, as always,